everyone, and welcome. My name is Michelle Mungal. Thank you for joining tonight's Telephone Town Hall, and I'm very excited to be here with you, and I'm really looking forward to start our discussion on the issues that matter most to you. Right now, we are calling thousands of your neighbors from across Nelson Creston, and uh, as soon as uh, we get lots of people on the line, we'll be starting our discussion. I just want to let you know, though, right now, that if you hear some bells ring over the course of the next hour, it's not your doorbell. Uh, those bells would be alerting me that there's a vote in the legislature because we are actually having a rare evening sitting right now. That was just decided earlier today, uh, this afternoon. So there's um, an evening session going on right now. If you hear some bells, I'm going to have to unfortunately leave the call and make sure that your voice is heard by uh, voting on the matter at hand in the legislature. That said, I highly doubt that that's going to happen, but I wanted to make sure you knew in advance. So it's going to take a few more minutes to connect with everyone. So let me take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, Ed May, who will explain how a telephone town hall works. Ed. Hello, everyone. My name is Ed May, and as Michelle said, I'll be hosting tonight's live and interactive telephone town hall. Right now, people from across Nelson Preston are answering the phones and connecting to the discussion. In a way, it's like a traditional town hall where guests arrive and file in through the front door, except in place of a front door, we've got thousands of phones ringing throughout Nelson Creston. Once someone answers uh, their phone, you can just stay on the line to join the discussion. For those who missed the call, an answering machine message will be left with directions on how to call in. This technology lets us reach out and talk with thousands of people from the comfort of their homes. It's a great way for Michelle to stay connected with you and ensures that she can hear from you directly. And, and in fact, you can ask her questions live and hear her answers. So for those of you just joining the call, hello and welcome. Thanks so much for taking the time to join me on this telephone town hall. As Ed said, it's a great way for me to connect with all of you back home while I'm here in Victoria to hear directly from you and uh, have a really good discussion about what's going on and what's important for our region. So I still see that we have some more phones to call. So as we wait for everyone to join in, I'd like to take a minute and let you know about something that you might have already seen in the news today. Uh, it was a very exciting day for myself, but most importantly for my new son, Xavier, who is two and a half months old. Uh, we had a little bit of history here in the legislature and Xavier breaking ground with being the first baby to be introduced from the floor of a member's seat or from the floor of the legislature from my seat specifically. So what this means is that back in March, we changed the rules that govern our legislature here in BC so that if a parent uh, needs to, they can be accompanied or they can have their, their baby with them on the floor of the legislature. So this came about uh, out of need, as often changes do, because I was pregnant and I was thinking ahead to the fact that what if the bells ring, just like I mentioned earlier, that we might have some bells ringing this evening calling us to go vote. And I had my son with me and was not able to pass them on to somebody else for childcare. How would I make sure that your vote was, uh, was um, uh, recorded? How would I make sure that I'd be able to get down to the house to vote? Well, I'd need to take my son with me. So today, uh, Xavier made baby's first, a baby's first appearance on the floor of the legislature, and it really shows that our democratic institutions are becoming more family friendly and more inclusive, and that is very, very good for our democracy, especially in 2018, about 100 years after women first got the right to vote. Thanks, Michelle. For those of you just joining us on the call, we're here tonight for a special telephone town hall discussion with MLA Michelle Mongao. Tonight, you'll get a chance to ask Michelle your questions and share your thoughts through real-time interactive quick polls. If you have a question for Michelle, all you have to do is press star 3 on your phone at any time, and you'll be connected with an operator briefly who will uh, chat with you and take down your question, and then you'll be put in line to ask your question live. Uh, looking at our assistance, I can see there are thousands of people joining on the line. There are still more to join the call. So before we officially uh, begin and take and have a first uh, question from the phones, I wanted to take a moment to ask Michelle a question of my own. 
Of course, we're uh, coming up to the uh, referendum on proportional representation. Question is, why is this so important to people? Uh, well, Ed, as you can imagine, this is uh, very important for British Columbians all over the province. But I have to say that in my writing, it's something that we've been talking about for a very long time. I remember actually um, back in 2002 um, hosting myself, uh, along with some others, hosting uh, discussions um, and teach-ins and, and uh, various conversations open to the public about proportional representation. And at the time, uh, we were talking about different systems, and one system that uh, a lot of people really thought would reflect well here in British Columbia, it reflects the way in which we vote and how we politically participate, is the mixed member plurality system. And that, that system is one of the three that voters can choose in the upcoming referendum. But of course, the first question on the ballot is whether or not we want to change our existing electoral system or not. Um, for me, I think this is a very important question, and I hope that uh, British Columbians consider it very seriously because how we change, how we vote, determines how decisions are made and who's making those decisions. And often in our system, it's a, a winner-take-all. So uh, whether or not 40% of the population voted for a polit political party. Uh, is not necessarily how many seats that they'll get in the House. They will often end up with much more than 40%. So say 40% of the population voted um, for the BC Liberals, but they get 60% of the seats in the House. So they have all the say. Whereas the public actually was trying to indicate to those who are running into government that they wanted to have um, more of a coalition, a mix of views and values working together across different party lines. And what we've been showing in the last year is that that is possible in Canada. It happens all over the world and many other countries. Um, but could it happen here in Canada? Well, yes, it can. And we've been doing it for the last year with the Green parties. And so uh, proportional representation, very important. It's an opportunity for people to be better reflected in their government and who's making the decisions that impact them every day. Thanks, Michelle. And I just want to remind everybody, for those of you who are just joining, uh, welcome to the Telephone Town Hall. If you have a question for Michelle, uh, all you have to do is, again, just press star 3 on your phone at any point during the call, and an operator will take down your question and put you in line to ask your question live. Uh, I'd like to uh, get started with our first poll of the evening. And so I'll, what I'll do is I'll read the question. And, uh, and, the, and then what you'll, you'll have two different options for this first poll, and all you have to do is press the number on your phone for, for the choice you have. So the, and I'll repeat the question. So the first poll question is, is BC on the right track? So press 1 on your phone if you think BC is on the right track. Press 2 on your phone if you think BC is not on the right track. So I'll just repeat it again. Uh, the question is, is BC on the right track? Press 1 on your phone if you think BC is on the right track. Press 2 on your phone if you think BC is not on the right track. Thanks for letting me know what you think. Uh, I'd like to remind again, just quickly again, if you have a question, just press star 3 and an operator will take down your question and put you in line to ask your question live. Uh, now I'm going to go to our first question from the phones. And this question is from Robert. Uh, he's from Nelson, and he has a question about road maintenance. Robert, you're on the line and can ask your question. My question is about highway safety. Uh, last winter in the Kootenays, we had uh, very bad road conditions. We had glare ice conditions, which was caused because the plows were not out early enough, and the, the, comp the ice became compact, and, and we had slippery roads, and they poured liquid the ice on top, and they had glare ice conditions. So. That's completely backwards to what the highways ministry used to do. So what have we got going for this coming winter? Are we going to have improved safety or more of the same with deaths and accidents? Thanks for your question, Robert. Over to you, Michelle. Thank you. So, uh, Robert, as you can imagine, as an MLA for uh, a lo fairly large rural area, uh, I drive those winter roads quite a lot. And just here's a, a fun fact for everybody out there. If you're wondering what the longest straight stretch of highway there is in the West Kootenays, 
It's 3.2 kilometers long. It's outside of Creston. So a winter road that uh, goes through all the curves around the mountains can be pretty scary, especially when we have those icy conditions that you were talking about, Robert. Uh, so winter, winter safety is really important. And one of the things uh, that we're doing is uh, we're investing uh, 1.8 million over the next three years uh, in more weather stations and overhead signs. So uh, for those of you who see those overhead signs outside of Creston, outside of Nelson, uh, those are very important and always important to take a look at to uh, get a sense of what some of the weather conditions are for the road and they'll be giving you safety information. So we're looking to increase those throughout the province. They've been very good for our area. Uh, we're extending the winter tire requirements on selected highways uh, to April 30th from March 31st, so that's an extra month. And as we know in our area, the pass, I, well, I can tell you right now, Robert, I drive it often in the spring, and there's snow up there often right till the end of May. So that we're extending that I think is a good thing for our area and will keep people safer. And uh, another big important thing, especially for that pass, is having stricter commercial vehicle chain-up requirements. Uh, I can tell you I pass a lot of commercial vehicles when uh, I'm on that highway and uh, we know that it's a major commercial corridor so if we can keep our commercial drivers safer uh, that impacts all drivers as well on the road uh, with less accidents because when, uh, when a semi has an accident that impacts everybody and can be very detrimental to everybody else driving. So we're looking at some of those safety measures and uh, we're going to be implementing them in the next year. Thanks, Robert, for your question, and also thanks to Michelle for the answer. And I'll go straight to the next question. The next question is from Becky. Becky's in Creston. And it looks like Becky has a question about daycare or child care. Go ahead, Becky, you're on. Uh, thank you very much. And Michelle, first of all, congratulations on being allowed to have your baby on the floor. I think that's such an important issue. And I'm so glad that we finally took a step in the right direction. Thank you. Um, I have I have two questions, I think. Um, the one of them, the first one is, how is the NDP ensuring daycare is affordable for all of those who currently need it in this province? Uh, so it, it, ask, oh, sorry, I'll let you ask the second question, Becky. And my second question is, I'd like an update regarding um, safe homes or stop the violence against women programs currently. So let's start with the daycare question. Then. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, the thing that I'm so incredibly proud of, which is the full funding envelope that we've put forward uh, as we develop a new, an entirely new social program here in British Columbia for childcare, and that's a billion dollars over three years came out of this budget. So that billion dollars is going straight into childcare spaces and as well as making childcare more affordable for families. So I'll give you an example. In Nelson, recently we announced 18 new childcare spaces at the Schoolhouse Early Learning Center. And uh, I was talking to um, a mom locally, and she was telling me how the new investments and the subsidies are working for her. And essentially, she's paying um, about $1,000 less each month in childcare costs. So that was huge for her family, very, very significant uh, savings for her family and uh, what that's going to mean locally. And they're going to be able to contribute to our local economy better as a result. Um, and that's the reason that uh, that's happened is because of the billion dollars, we put $630 million directly into fee reduction and affordable child care benefits. Um, one thing that I, I'll tell you, Becky, that I hear a lot about, though, is what are we doing to support our early childhood edu educators? And we've already put in $136 million investment into boosting wages because, as we know, uh, it's mostly women who work in this sector, and they're not working at very uh, good wages. And so what can we do to improve wages so we can attract more people into this sector so that we can actually uh, fill out those spaces uh, with the child care provider that we need? And uh, so I'm really glad that this government's been looking at 
uh, all the different ways that we need to be investing in child care and how we can build up this social program. And just so everybody knows, uh, one of the things that I've been doing personally is making sure that all of our child care providers in the region are kept up to date with all the new changes to this program. We, we email them regularly, we're calling them regularly, and making sure that they know about funding opportunities and how this program is rolling out. Uh, and then in terms of um, safe, the homes for safe Homes for Women, thank you very much. Uh, again, this government took quick action to invest into uh, transition homes for women. And uh, we're going to be funding uh, 1,500 ho new homes for women fleeing violence. And I think that's uh, absolutely critical that we're supporting women because everybody has the, the basic right to safety. And they have a right to be safe in their homes. And sometimes that doesn't happen for people, and uh, it's very tragic and sad that it doesn't. So what can we do as a society to support them getting that safety? And so making sure that we have enough spaces around the province is critical, and I'm glad that we're doing that. Thanks, Becky, uh, for your questions, and thanks again to Michelle uh, for the answer. I just uh, We do have a lot of questions tonight, so please, if you can keep uh, your questions just to one question per person, that would be great. Um, but I'd like to jump right to the next question. Our next question is from David, and David's from Creston again, and the question is uh, related to senior care and getting better senior care. David, you're on the line and can ask your question. Yeah. Yeah, hello, Michelle. I appreciate that you're doing this. I, I'm in my 10th year out here in Creston, and I didn't know it was a retirement community, but uh, I just wonder if the government, in the NDP government in Victoria is looking at maybe getting better health care here for seniors in Creston because we make up most of the population here. And it's getting more and so that way. Like. You bet, David. Um, did, I don't know if you knew this, David, but Creston has the eldest uh, population demographic in the Columbia Basin, and Nelson has the youngest. So. I represent a, quite a diversity in age groups. And so for our seniors in Creston, uh, one of the big issues in Creston that's um, been around for quite some time is uh, the need for primary care providers. And so making sure that people are attached to doctors, that you have a doctor, a family doctor that you can regularly go to. And so that's one of the things that uh, this government has been investing in actually. Um, uh, Quite, uh, quite a lot with our budget uh, 2018 is how do we uh, increase recruitment of doctors to British Columbia, especially to our rural communities. Um, one of the things, though, that we also need to look at is residential care in our communities. And Creston, I've, I've toured our, our various residential care homes in Creston uh, several times, and uh, exceptional care at both of those. But, of course, our population is aging, and are we going to have enough space for the seniors who, who need uh, those uh, care spaces, those care beds uh, later in life? And so, um, so that you know, uh, I, I've been tossing around a lot of big numbers, but I want to make sure that everybody understands that uh, a lot of these things, these services, uh, require government priority and government investment. And we've been making those investments, and that's why I was very, very proud of our budget uh, in uh, in the fall. And so, for our seniors care, uh, it's 548 million dollars uh, for better residential care for seniors, and that includes making sure that you have the right staff people, qualified staff people, in those assisted living facilities. Uh, there's another number here for you: 150 million to help connect British Columbians. Sorry, without a family doctor. Pardon me, I was talking about that already, and I just looked over at my note to remind me that it's $150 million that we're investing uh, to make sure that people can connect with a family doctor and a primary care provider, whether that's a nurse practitioner or a GP. So, uh, and then, of course, uh, what a lot of, for a lot of seniors, uh, pharmacare is a big issue. And so we've put another $105 million into our Fair Pharmacare program. So that will be eliminating or at the very least reducing deductibles for many British Columbians, especially for seniors on low incomes within our region. So, um, so I'm pretty proud of what we've been able to do in this last budget and really glad that we're prioritizing seniors. Great. Thank you, David, for your question and thank you, Michelle, for your, uh, for your answer. 
Uh, we're get, we're, I'm just going to have, uh, uh, we're going to go to the next poll question and we'll have uh, Michelle go through the poll question in a, in a moment, but I just want to remind everybody, if you do have a question, all you have to do is press star three and you'll be connected to an operator who will take down your question and then uh, and you'll be put in the queue so that you can ask your own question live. Uh, so Michelle, did you want to go through the next uh, poll question? You bet. So I'm really I'm really interested in what are the issues of most concern to you. Uh, so here are your choices. Sorry, I, we can't make it uh, uh, fill it in and just tell me whatever you like, but you can always email me at my constituency office or give us a call there uh, if you want to discuss anything further. But for this poll, I'm going to ask you to tell me what's most of concern to you. So press 1 if it's affordability. Press 2 if it's the environment, press three if it's education, and press four if it's jobs and the economy. So I'll repeat that. My question for this poll is what issue is of most concern to you? Press one for affordability, press two for the environment, press three for education, and press four for jobs in the economy. And if you have a none of the above answer, no problem, just email me at my constituency office, michelle.mongal.mla at leg.bc.ca. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks everybody for participating in the poll. Uh, I'd like to go back to questions, uh, but the, the next question was a question that was submitted to the constituency office, and so I'll just read it out. Uh, hi, my name is Herb Couch. The question is, what will you do to help our current local cannabis industry, uh, farmers, consumers, dispensaries, and their employee, employees, et cetera, have a fair chance to participate and transi transition into the legal market? Thank you very much, Herb, for that question. I know that you've been very active on this issue for, for quite some time and have really been leading the charge uh, in our region in terms of legalization, and I'm very pleased to see that that's finally going to happen this week. So I think the best way to answer this question is not necessarily what am I going to do, but what have I already done? Uh, one of the things I've done um, is very shortly after we became government is I convened a roundtable of some of the people who are going to be most impacted uh, by legislation. So that's uh, the growers, um, uh, retailers, and uh, some of the people who are looking to get into the industry as well. And I, I brought them together in my constituency office and we had a really good conversation about what were the things that they really wanted to see. And one of the issues that really concerned our region was that we needed to make sure that the legalization and the licensing allowed for the success of small scale producers and craft growers. And uh, originally, um, from the federal government, it was looking like that it was going to be a type of uh, legal framework that would really promote and, su and better support large-scale operators rather than small-scale operators. And as we know in our region, in the Kootenays, there's been a lot of people with a lot of expertise and knowledge that's developed over the years because they've had to operate in the legal market on a very small scale. Uh, so now that we have legalization, which is very much welcomed, we want to be able to maintain that small-scale operation and make sure that people can get in uh, to it rather than maintaining a black market and making things continually precarious. So the good news is that uh, I brought those concerns directly to my colleague, Mike Farnworth, who's the minister responsible for cannabis legalization, and, and he, he got it. He got it right away and thus began BC's advocacy to the federal government that there has to be room for small-scale operators and craft growers. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, our, our advocacy was successful, that there will be room for, for those uh, very operators those, uh, and those craft growers, and uh, that they will be able to uh, continue with uh, their practices and with uh, their business uh, under a legal framework. Great. Thank you, Michelle, for the answer, and thanks to Herb for uh, emailing in uh, his question. Uh, we can jump right to the next question. The next question is from Phil, who is from Nelson, and Phil has a question about uh, alternatives to the Greyhound closures. 
Phil, you're on the line, and you can ask your question. Yes, yes, I am. Uh, <clears throat> as it is, an, an alternative to Greyhound has been found for the Nelson Kelowna run, but none from uh, Nelson to Creston or to Cranbrook or to Calgary, and my need is to reach uh, Creston. Uh, I was wondering if no private, private enterprise springs up to take over from Greyhound, how long will we have to wait? And cannot the BC government take over until an entrepreneur steps into the breach? Uh, thanks, Phil. I, and I, I totally hear you, what you're saying about uh, making sure that we have those transportation services. Uh, and I'm very glad to see that a private operator is stepped up. And in fact, we actually see private operators all over the province uh, coming forward and taking over those Greyhound routes. And the reason why they're able to do so so quickly is because uh, Minister Trevena, who's responsible for transportation, she's also a rural MLA, so she totally got it when uh, those of us who come from rural communities were saying to her, we have to prioritize this. And so the Pre Passenger Transportation Board uh, started prioritizing these applications and to put them through in a timely manner so communities could be um, covered as soon as possible. I don't know if there is uh, currently an application for um, an eastbound route from Nelson into, uh, into Alberta and over to Calgary, um, but as you can imagine, there's communities all across Western Canada who are dealing with this right now. And, and quite at the last minute, we did not anticipate Greyhound would be pulling out and pulling out so quickly. So we're waiting to see what the, the private sector does uh, because there is a business model there to be had. In terms of will the BC government take over, uh, that's a broader conversation that would require some consultation and also some good number crunching as well because uh, we'd have to determine if that is going to be um, an appropriate uh, uh, activity for government to do when it's been done by the private sector for so long. So that would I, I don't have an answer for you right now on that, but it would have to be a larger question. And what we could do in my community office, Phil, if you don't mind giving us a call there at uh, 1-877-388-4498. If you want to give us a call there or send us an email, uh, we'll be able to do a little bit of digging for you and see if we can find out if there's an application right now for an eastbound route. Thanks very much, uh, Phil, for the question and Michelle for the answer. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know we're just past halfway uh, in the telephone town hall. and. Uh, for people, if you if you do have a question uh, for Michelle, a more detailed question, uh, you can. We'll, what we're going to do is at the end of the telephone town hall, you're, you'll be able to stay on the line and be directly connected with voicemail to be able to leave a message for Michelle at the end. So if you do have another further question uh, or more detailed question, uh, feel free to stay on the line and record a message. And we're just about to go to the next uh, question in our queue. But I wanted to uh, give Michelle an opportunity to read out the results of the of the poll we just did and what your answers were. You bet. So for all of those who are on the phone, uh, thank you so much for answering the poll. 20% uh, of you said affordability is your number one concern. 52% said the environment. 12% said education. And 16% said jobs in the economy. So thanks again so much for participating. This is great. Great, and we're going to go to the phone now and, uh, to get our next question, but I did just want to remind anybody, everybody that if you have a question, all you have to do is press star 3, and you'll be connected to an operator who will take down your question and then put you in the queue so that you're able to ask your question live. The next question is from Jean. Jean is from Selmo. Uh, Jean has another, a further question follow-up on uh, the proportional representation discussion we had earlier. Go ahead, Jean. You're on the line. Thank you. Um, I have worked elections for over 50 years, and I was supervisor when the uh, yes-no vote for uh, whether BC or Canada and Quebec left Canada, and it was a nightmare. It was not the people do not understand what they're voting for half the time. So I would like to see if you do change it a few elections before it starts. I don't work the elections now as I'm almost 90, but it was terrible. Jean, so am I to understand you, you're you looking for more uh, clarity on the proportional representation? Everybody to learn at first. Okay, did you want to talk about that, Michelle? 
Yeah, sure. And thank you so much for your question, Jean. And uh, I always love hearing from people in Salmo. You'll be happy to know that I proudly wear my Salmo dinner jacket when I'm in Victoria, almost wherever I go. And um, and people always ask about it. Uh, so proportional representation. How do we clearly explain it? Because uh, any time it's a it, you have a shift in an electoral system, uh, it can be pretty complicated for a lot of people. And uh, one of the best ways I like to explain it is uh, to think about your ballot and how will your ballot change. So generally in um, proportional systems, and it it'll depend on what kind of system people vote for in this elect in this referendum, but uh, generally in a proportional system you will have a ballot that has two sides to it. One, you're voting for your regional candidate, and the other side, you're voting for your party of choice. Now, your regional candidate that you like the best might be of the same party as your party of choice, or they might be of a different party, but you can choose. So, for example, if you like your local candidate, um, and they're with the BC Liberals, for example, and I'm not being partisan here, uh, then you can mark them off. But if you prefer the New Democrats or the Greens, then you, you can choose a different party. Or if you prefer the BC Liberal Party, uh, you can choose that as well. So, And then how it gets translated is that if 40% of the population vote for the NDP, then they get 40% of the seats. And British Columbians' values are represented uh, accordingly and appropriately in the decision-making structure. And so we get a better government that works for British Columbians. In terms of how we're going to go about it if the referendum is successful and most people vote yes to changing our electoral system, uh, what we've committed to doing is uh, after two election cycles, people will be able to vote on whether they want to keep this new system. So. Once people get a chance to practice it, and if they like it, they can vote to keep it, and if they don't like it, they can vote to get rid of it. And so one of the best ways for people to understand how a system works is through practice, and that's why we're going to review it after people get that chance. Great, Jean. Thank you for the question, and thank you, Michelle, for the answer. And we'll go right over to the next question. The, question, the next question is from Janet, also from Creston. And uh, Janet has a question about affordable housing for seniors. Janet, you're on the line and can ask your question. Yes, good evening, Michelle. Uh, you and I have talked about this several times, so um, I just wanted to touch base with you again on this issue of seniors staying in their own homes as opposed to affordable housing in rents or care facilities or senior apartments. Um, my biggest concern is the ever-increasing hydro. Um, it just continually keeps going up, and I thought that was one of the election um, statements was that there would be no more increases. However, it appears that there was more increases, and at one time um, I thought that anyone that had an outstanding account would, would get a rebate. That, that doesn't seem to have happened. Um, I've gone through all the channels through Fortis. They've sent a person out here. My home is 12 years old. It's fully insulated. It's right up to par. Um, they left me some light bulbs and told me to put a sweater on. Well, I pay $305 on equal payment. Last year I paid $225. They increased it um, in January because I was $1,400 in arrears. So, so Janet, this, is, this isn't sustainable. So uh, what my question is, is the government got any plans to help seniors um, with hydro, with things like glasses, dentures, all these things that we don't get paid through medical, and all these things contribute to the fact that it's very, very difficult to make your money stretch when you have such high cost to keep your home going. Okay, thanks very much for your question, Janet. Michelle? Yes, thank you, Janet. And uh, I hear you when you're talking about how life keeps getting more and more expensive, especially when you're on a fixed income. 
So um, one of the things in British Columbia is that not everybody's covered by uh, a public utility, BC Hydro or municipal uh, hydro like Nelson Hydro, uh, but there's Fortis, uh, B Fortis BC Hydro. And for people in Creston, that is your hydroelectric supplier. So we have a regulator called the BC Utilities Commission, and they review all applications for rate increases for um, the uh, business plans. Uh, they're called something else in utilities, but just for, for ease's sake, we'll call them this evening business plans. Uh, and they review all of that, and then they determine whether rate increases are allowed. So the BC Utilities Commission uh, is the regulator that oversees Fortis BC and determines whether or not they can do rate increases, not the provincial government. Um, when we make commitments about uh, where rates will go, we're talking about our crown corporation, BC Hydro. And uh, so because that's where we have uh, influence and uh, some control. But even there, we don't have very much control. So uh, last fall, I instructed BC Hydro to apply to the BC Utilities Commission for a rate freeze. Uh, the BC Utilities Commission, as the regulator, said no to that rate freeze. So they really made me eat my words. Fair enough. Uh, that's their job, is to review and, uh, these types of requests and work in the best interests of, uh, of the utility and all rate payers. So uh, in response, we launched the crisis grant uh, for people to apply to, and they can receive up to $600 of uh, non-repayable grants uh, towards their hydro bills, so that uh, they can, um, so that when in a crisis, you're, you're, it's acknowledged, and we recognize that you need to keep your power on, and that sometimes making life affordable means that uh, uh, you need a grant. Uh, and we're looking at ways, so ever since I got that answer from BC Utilities Commission, my ministry has been uh, putting their nose to the grindstone and really looking at ways in which we can come at this from a different angle to reduce uh, annual rate increases uh, as much as we possible can, possibly can. And so we're still working on that, and I hope to have some results back to British Columbians in short order. But uh, some of the other things that we've been doing looking at ways in which we can make life affordable. Uh, we've been, obviously, we eliminate, we're eliminating MSP premiums, uh, so that's very important for a lot of people. And uh, we're looking at, um, uh, like I said earlier, the fair pharmacare, so that we're uh, eliminating uh, deductibles. And we're also looking at uh, ICBC rates, as that has, uh, there was planned increases that were uh, quite substantial under the BC Liberals, and we've reduced those increases, and we're getting ICBC finances under control because uh, you probably remember from the news uh, there was a major $1 billion problem uh, at ICBC, and so we're getting that back under control and making sure that there's good fiscal management there. So there's a variety of things that we're looking at, and, uh, and, and Janet, I hear you on, on the, uh, the hydro costs. Uh, with uh, Fortis. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, out of my, my scope of uh, direct input, but um, I meet with them regularly, so I'll be passing your concerns on for you. Thanks to, to Jennifer for the question, and thanks, Michelle, for the answer. Uh, before we go back to the phones, I want to take another question that was submitted to the constituency uh, office ahead of time. This question was from Kathy in Caslo. And Kathy had a question about uh, what support there is for special needs education, and uh, as, as she has a son who's uh, in looking for support in full time in school. You bet. Well, I feel like I've been uh, living through this issue for quite some time, uh, and hearing about it from constituents for a very long time. And uh, as we all know, teachers fought for well over a decade on the issue of class size and composition. And the reason why they were fighting that is because children with special needs were not getting the care and attention that they needed so that they could excel to the best of their abilities in school. And I really want to thank teachers out there listening right now for taking that fight on. Uh, the previous uh, BC Liberal government 
um, did not respond well, and uh, it's a shame that we had to fight for so long to finally address this issue and go through court case after court case after court case to only be told that uh, for 10 years you were right. And so uh, we are funding um, those class size and composition uh, issues that the BC teachers brought up uh, fully. That was one of our top priorities when we came in with our very first budget update in uh, a year ago now. Um, but of course, what, what can we be doing to make sure that uh, students are getting the services that they need? And we've committed to supporting the school districts, who of course are responsible for uh, these services on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're committing to supporting them uh, in full to improve services for children with diverse needs and making sure that there's inclusivity in the classroom uh, because when we have diversity, we're all a stronger community as a result and it's really important that everybody's included. Um, I wanted to also mention that we're creating more resources for teachers that will include a video series for educators to support diverse learners in their classroom so that teachers are better equipped to meet the needs of the kids that they're teaching. And uh, I should also let you know that the Deputy Minister of Education has met with the deans of post-secondary schools and started conversations on enhancing those teacher training programs. So uh, not only will we be doing those uh, video series for existing teachers, but we're looking at uh, the teachers that are coming up the line and how we can make sure that they have the skills necessary in those classrooms. So once again, I just want to say how important it is that all children have the, uh, the supports that they need to excel. And I'm very glad that we're finally funding that appropriately through class size and composition, but we're going a step further in making sure that teachers have the supports that they need in place so that they can teach to the best of their abilities all the kids in their classroom. Thanks, Michelle. And I'd like to also thank Kathy for submitting that question to the constituency office. Uh, before we take our next question from the phone, I just wanted a quick reminder that uh, we have a little bit of time left in the call this evening. If you do have a question, uh, press star 3 and you'll be connected with an operator who will take down your question and you'll be put in the queue. Uh, but before we go to our next question, I wanted to, to go through our third and final poll of the evening. And, uh, and Michelle, would you like to take us through the, the final poll? Sure. So I, we've had the, I've, I've tossed out a lot of numbers this evening and talked about a lot of different programs. So I'm wondering which ones have benefited you the most. So I'm going to give you four choices. And again, if none of these choices apply to you, no worries. Send me an email at michelle.mongal.mla at leg.bc.ca. So here are the ch four choices for the question of which of the following have benefited you the most. Press 1 if you've benefited most from the $1 billion investment in child care. Press 2 if you've benefited most from reducing MSP payments by 50%. Press 3 if you've benefited most from closing rental loopholes and limiting the allowable rent increase to 2.5%. And press 4 if you've benefited most from providing funding for 3,700 new teachers. So again, which of the following have benefited you the most? One, the billion dollar investment in child care. Two, reducing MSP payments by 50%. Press three, if you've benefited most from closing rental loopholes and limiting the allowable rent increase to 2.5%. And press four, for providing funding for 3,700 new teachers. Thank you, Michelle, and thanks to everybody who's participating in the poll. And we're going to go back to the phone lines, and the next question is from Steve, who's from Caslo, and Steve has a question about government addressing climate change. Steve, you're on the line, and you can ask your question. Hi, Michelle. Um, first of all, um, thanks very much for taking the call, and uh, uh, welcome to your little one into the world here. I understand that you've got a, a baby. That's great. I, I'm a father of three, too, and I'm, I'm finding it very difficult uh, to uh, discuss uh, climate change with them. It, it's overwhelming to me um, where, where we're headed. And uh, so I just wanted to ask you, first of all, uh, what we're doing about that. And um, if you've heard of a company called Carbon Engineering, who uh, is in Squamish, and they've developed technology that harvests carbon out of the air, 
and they turn it into uh, carbon-free fuel for internal combustion engines and jet engines. Thanks, thanks a lot for the question, Steve. Michelle? Thank you, uh, Steve. I am so glad that you brought up uh, carbon engineering in Squamish because I just recently learned about what they're doing and I'm really excited to get a tour. So my office is actually connecting with them and trying to find some time where I can uh, go check out exactly what they're doing and how this innovative technology works. And I got to say that there are so many innovative technologies taking place and being experimented with here in British Columbia that could have amazing global applications in terms of reducing global greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, one of the ways that we're supporting that type of technological innovation and investment uh, is making an investment ourselves as uh, uh, British Columbia through what's called the ICE Fund. And I'm sorry, I don't have what that acronym spells out right now, but it's not really that important. What's important is that it's a, it's a fund dedicated to looking at ways in which we can uh, reduce our carbon emissions and help fund uh, these uh, technological breakthroughs and, and uh, how we can obviously um, get those out to the rest of the world. And so, uh, uh, one of the things that we've looked at, for example, is um, quantum computing. And uh, computers actually suck up a lot of energy. So how do we make them more energy efficient? And so we're looking at ways that we can do that. And uh, this one company, D-Wave, has been identifying that. And we're going to be um, uh, we're looking at uh, possibly uh, providing them with uh, some funding to enhance their technology that, like I said, can have global applications. Um, but there is so much that we're doing on, in terms of what, how we can reduce our carbon emissions and how we can influence that. Uh, my ministry is also responsible for the Clean Energy Vehicle Program, and that was, uh, I say was, $40 million. Uh, and the reason why it was is because we've had to add an extra $10 million so for a total of $50 million, uh, the program has been so successful in BC, we're outpacing almost every other jurisdiction in North America right now for purchasing uh, zero emission vehicles. And part of the reason why we've been so successful in British Columbia is because we have incentive programs uh, like the program coming from my ministry. We're also looking at electrifying um, industry all across the province, because here in British Columbia, 98% of our, our electricity is carbon free. So how do we get more industry onto hydroelectricity and therefore reducing their carbon intensity? So the amount of carbon uh, that they produce from uh, in their entire production cycle. And uh, so we have natural gas production here in British Columbia in the Northeast. And um, uh, so how do we reduce the carbon emissions associated with the natural gas production? We're looking to uh, electrify our oil and gas fields. Um, we're also looking at renewable energy. So we have, uh, we're um, doing some exploration right now. A company named Borealis is doing exploration for geothermal, for example. So there's a lot of things that we're doing in, as a government already, but how do we bring it all together under a larger strategy that goes into the future? Because this is a critical question of our time. And so the Ministry of Environment has been working, my God, it feels like around the clock, actually. They've been working so hard. And we're going to see the results of that work um, within the next few months uh, in terms of how do we have clean growth BC. So we want to have a strong economy. We want to make sure that it's environmentally sustainable and that we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. These issues are not exclusive. They have to be put together in and moving into a modern era of how we look at our economy. And so we're coming out with a plan for that, and uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And so you'll be hearing more about it in the months ahead. Great. Uh, thank you, Michelle. And thank you also for the, uh, for, for the question, Steve. Uh, there's a quick question I have on the end, uh, to wrap it up at the end about the economy, but I wanted to give a question or wanted to give the uh, Michelle the poll results so she could read out uh, what the poll results from from that final poll were. Great, thanks everybody for participating. Uh, so the people who have uh, there's eight percent of you who have benefited from the one billion in childcare. 
56% of you from the reduction of 50% in MSP premium. 16% are benefiting from closing rental loopholes and only allowing a 2.5% increase. And funding for 3,700 new teachers, 20% are benefiting directly from that. So thanks very much again, everybody, for participating. And if you had something else uh, that uh, you wanted to share with me, never hesitate to email me at michelle.mungal.mla at leg.bc.ca. Great. Uh, thanks, Michelle, for, for the results of the poll. And thanks again to everybody for participating. Uh, just feeding off uh, something you mentioned just recently, you spoke about the economy. And of course, uh, a huge part of Nelson Preston is, is agricultural land. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what government is doing to help farmers in your constituency and around the province. Uh, you bet. So um, I'm just going to take a minute here to brag. Uh, the Creston Valley produces some of the best food that you will ever, ever eat. And uh, whether it's carrots, apples, cherries, um, any of the, the beef, okay, I'm going to go on because we produce pretty much everything in the Creston Valley, including oranges and some of the greenhouses. So yes, we are doing citrus fruit here in Canada. And uh, there's just something about the water and there's just something about the soil because, oh my goodness, uh, you take a, a cherry off the tree or an apple off the tree and it's going to be the best that you've ever had. Uh, so, or carrots, uh, especially canyon carrots. Shout out to that farmer. Those are where my carrots come from. Uh, so, um, I could go on all day about how great the food is from Creston, but what are we doing to make sure that, that those farmers are still able to produce? Well, uh, our agricultural ministry has launched Grow, Feed, and Buy BC program. So I can't be the only one who's just enjoying Creston Goods anymore. The rest of BC is going to find out all about it uh, through our Buy BC program. But we also have special funding to help with our, our farmers in terms of being able to grow those products. And we want to make sure that we have food security, so we're also looking at programs for that. But one of the things that really keeps coming up in my area, and I know it's coming up around BC, is of course the cost of land can be very challenging. And we have new farmers, young farmers, who are struggling uh, just to be able to get access to land so they can do what they love. And I don't know if anybody in Creston remembers this, but years ago, back in 2010, I think was the year, I hosted a forum with young farmers. And I don't know if they remember, but there was a second person in the room. It was John Horgan, and he's now the premier. And he was there to listen to what do young farmers need, and he heard loud and clear about access to land. And John has kept that with him uh, all these years, and that's why we're starting a BC land matching program that connects farmers looking for land with land owners so that those young farmers can get the land that they need to uh, get out there and grow the products that we love to eat in BC and especially in Creston. So the person to connect with in the Columbia Basin is Haley Trook. Uh, she has been hired as the dedicated land matcher for our region uh, with help from Columbia Basin Trust. And so Haley, unfortunately I don't have your number, but if anybody is interested in connecting with Haley, give my office a call or an email and we'll make sure to connect you with Haley so she can connect you with some land. Thanks, Michelle, for that answer. Uh, we are almost at the end of tonight's telephone town hall. And before I ask Michelle for some closing remarks, I want to remind you all that everyone, uh, everybody at the end of the call will be able to leave a voice uh, message for Michelle. That includes asking for that phone number uh, for Haley. And, uh, so, and I just want to mention that if, if we didn't get a chance to, to take your question live or if uh, you didn't feel comfortable asking your question live, you can also just ask it uh, through the voicemail message at the end. Uh, and that will be immediately following Michelle's closing comments. Over to you, Michelle. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I'm amazed that the hour just went by so quickly and I feel like I've heard 
just from a small few group of people, and I would love to have heard from more people. So I'm going to ask everybody who didn't get a chance to ask their question uh, over this short hour to please don't hesitate to contact my office directly, whether it's by phone, by email, by snail mail, or by fax. Uh, you can give me a, a connect with me and uh, ask a question. We'll be able to get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Um, but if you're you see me walking down the street, whether it's in uh, Salmo, Creston, Caslow, Weimar, Balfour, uh, Crawford Bay, uh, wherever I am on Baker Street in Nelson, don't hesitate to stop me and uh, ask me your question or tell me what's on your mind. I'm always happy to engage with people uh, and. So I will give everybody my email and my phone number uh, one more time because uh, that's the way to get a hold of me. But like I said, don't hesitate to stop me on the street when you see me as well. So it's michelle.mungal.mla at leg.bc.ca and my 1-800 number is 1-877-388-4498. That's one 888 Four four nine eight. I have really enjoyed listening to all of you and hearing your questions and uh, having this great dialogue. Uh, I look forward to doing this again, Ed. I hope uh, I hope you will join me again, and I hope all of you who have phoned in will join me again as well. This is a great way to connect while I'm here in Victoria and away from home. So thank you all so much. Have a wonderful evening, and uh, just a reminder that your referendum vote packages are coming in the mail uh, in short order. I believe it is on October 22nd, and you have until November 30th to get your vote back in the mail and have your voice count on this referendum. And don't forget to vote in the municipal elections. Advanced polls in our area are October 17th from 8 in the morning to 8 at night, and voting day is October 20th from 8 in the morning till 8 at night. Lots of opportunities to participate in our great democracy. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great night.